So first, they have uh, some ice cores from Antarctica. Basically, um, those red dots and black dots are different titles for different programs. Each program has several ice cores there. Oh, before that, let me just mention, uh, since English is not my mother tongue, I try my best to deliver the lectures. And I realize some of them may not um, catch certain terminologies. And you can ask me after the class. I can spell it to you or just explain it in, in a mixture of Mandarin and English. That might be the easiest for me. <laughs> so anyway, those dots are different programs for um, ice core drilling. And the famous one is like the Vostok, the Taylor Domes ones are very well known and often reported in the news. And, and then let's look at the Greenland ice cores, which are even more uh, studies. In the Greenland ice cores, those purple dots and uh, black dots are also different programs for ice core drillings. Sometimes they were um, they, sometimes they were led by Americans, sometimes by Switzerland, and sometimes by Europeans. So um, the results um, usually published in different journals. But um, supposedly, they should agree. However, they have some discrepancies. And maybe due to the ice core sample qualities, or maybe due to the chronological problems. But anyway, in Greenland, the most famous one would be the GISP2. And then right next to it, GRIP, GRIPS uh, ice core programs. Because um, the reason I say they are the best is because um, the ice cap looks like a dome. And in the central part is the thickest part. Since we want to know past climate change, so the thicker, uh, the deeper we can get, it's the better, because it means it tells you uh, older histories of the ice precipitation. And also, um, on the margin of those ice caps, Usually, um, the ice melts a little bit in summer, so it disturbs the layers, which I show you in the previous slide, which gives you problems in terms of measuring or dating it. That's why um, people try to drill ice cores through the middle part of an ice cap. But usually, it is really difficult. First, it's difficult to reach there. Usually, you need a hel helicopters. But imagine you need to bring those uh, equipments there first. So um, usually it takes at least five to eight years to accomplish the whole programs. And I think in the following slides, we have some photos of their equipment. Let's take this two as example. Here it shows the elevation of the uh, of the sample locality, which is uh, about 3,200 meters high, which means if you can penetrate uh, till the bottom, you have the potential to have about 3,000 um, meter long ice cores. And here is a, a shot of their drilling equipment. This, this is the, the things they penetrate the ice cores beneath. And it needs a dome to support it. The lens, I should say, uh, the diameter of this dome is about 30 meter. And the height of this uh, tower, let's call it tower temporarily, is also about 30 meters. And if you take a picture inside the dome, it looks like this. There are lots of alternating tubes which means when you penetrate uh, one, when you penetrate the ice core, you can take out one segment. At the same time, you drop another set of the tube to take uh, the second set of that and continuously to switch. Then it can prevent the hole collapsing. If it collapses, then you can, can now get the continuous coring. And this is uh, the shot 
Above the grounds, all the labs and working areas are underneath. Why do they do that underneath? Because um, it's more stable underneath. They can control the temperature without any problem and just store the ice cores there. You don't, you don't need a refrigerator there because itself is cold there. And people, these little houses there, people live above the grounds, but usually they work here. And OK, then let's take a look about uh, a freshly drilled ice core. Basically, this is the drill pit. And you just pull out a segment of the ice and lay it on top. And when we do this kind of research, the most important thing is to label the bottom of the ice and the top of the segments. because. We want to know ch changes through time, right? So if you get it reversed, you will have a totally opposite trend from others. And I know this sounds ridiculous, but it happened in before in one of the course. And they even think they found the most significant uh, records in this world because, because it's so unique. When they try to publish, the reviewers um, accidentally reverse their curve and realize it looks like totally like mirror image. And they suggest them to double check that. Then they realize they just mislabel the top and bottom. So that's important whenever you do any science, always label everything and record everything what you did. And I think for this one, they have not labeled it yet. So this is a, not a very good example. So this will like will look like um, before before you actually move larger equipment there. You usually want to do some test just to see the thickness of those eyes at the chosen spot. So here shows some photos over their test drillings. You can see the holes, and this is the size of the uh, 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 stripe and. A scientist holding uh, an ice core like this, it means uh, their testing is successful. So um, she was really happy about that. And this is roughly the regular size of an ice core. It's much, much larger than the core for the tree rings. And, and here you can see they try to prepare the drilling pits. Just, it's, it's uh, it's, it's something like this. They need to put it really vertical in order to get a good penetration. Otherwise, if you have a tilted, um, tilted position, you cannot really penetrate to too deep. And also, your climate signals will be a little bit distorted. And OK, let's look at uh, the real photo of those ice cores. And um, we'll need some time to uh, go through these slides. We have three pictures here. This is uh, the shallowest ice core. And this is the middle part. This is the bottom part. The shallowest part, it looks like snow, right? It's very loose because uh, the snow is just precipitated on top of those ice caps. So it's still very soft. and. Um, we cannot really know the age very uh, very well in this area, but for the middle part, because of the weight of those snow, um, these snows gradually um, get more and more compact. We can call it firm, and it begin to show some layers. I think you can s you can see some of them are darker, some of them are whiter, and also with certain patterns. And for a well-trained ice core scientist, they can count these layers. And also, at, at most areas, they are annual. But sometimes, uh, they may be several layers within one year. But an experienced scientist can tell you um, how many years in these segments. And why do we have darker layers and whiter layers? It usually related to uh, I should say it's seasonal changes. 
depending on the wind directions. When the dust, um, when there is more dusty wings, there are more dust traps in those eyes, then it gets darker. And if the wind direction changes or somehow um, there was more vegetation on top of the desert, less dust tra gets transported to polar regions, then we have a wider layers. So uh, that's basically the principle. Some people try to measure the dust concentrations in those layers. It could somehow correlate to the dryness um, of the lower latitude desert. And sometimes we can measure uh, the ice itself. We can measure the isotope, oxygen isotope in the ice or measure the chlorines and uh, some other ions in this ice and they all correlate to certain parameters in climate. Some of them correlate to the air temperature right above the ice cap, such as uh, oxygen isotopes. And for the bottom photo, this is a really deep part for those, um, for those ice cap. And it almost reached the bedrocks of this place. So it has sealed sand, rocks, that kind of things. And also, it's very difficult to count layers here, again. Um, um, so from these photos, we'll, we can know that um, the most workable segment of ice is this part, because you can count the layer to establish the chronologies. Otherwise, there's no way for you to know the age of the samples. And this is really important because um, based on this, uh, supposedly all the ice, ice cores should correlate very well. But sometimes they could have been some missing layers. That's why different projects um, cannot 100% perfectly match. But still, the general trends should be the same. And now let's look at uh, what we can do with the corals. And for the top two figures, they are live corals. And for, especially for this one, um, it's a shallow coral, only grows within zero to five meter depth, water depth. So let's say, if you can be sure you find this kind of corals in your sediments or in your strata, Then you determine the age of these corals. You will know the past sea level was there at that time. And for most corals, uh, this is what they look under the sea. And if they become fossils, or if you sample them, wash them, they look like this. And for most of my fossil, uh, Actually, I spend lots of time on working on fossil corals. Most of them look like this. And it's not as complete as live ones, but we can still um, measure them to determine some um, paleoparameters. And the next page, I want to show you um, if those fossils uh, get uplifted due to tectonics, what would they look like? This is a photo from Barbados, and they are famous of their uplifted corals. And this, this one, in the past, I should say about, um, about 125,000 years ago, they were under the sea. They were coral reefs, and now gets uplifted. So the whole thing are fossil corals. And what we can do is to drill a piece out of that and to measure uh, the chemical composition in those carbonates. Because for corals, mostly their carbonate record the contemporaneous chemistry in the seawater. Not only we can study the uplifted fossil corals, we can also look at uh, modern corals, live corals under the sea. Oh, sorry, 
let me just show you how we sample it. So um, basically we have to climb up or choose some suitable boulders here. And if you look at this word, experienced scientists would spot immediately this block and this block are big fossil corals. So we can use a rock drill to drill through it just to take it out. And you can see here it's already a hole that we're using this drill taken out. We can also do this for live corals with permission. These two photos um, were works by Dr. Shen in National Taiwan University. And um, first, you have to uh, file some forms, get the permission from the governments to enter the environmental protected areas. Tell them how much samples you need, what kind of purpose you are going, uh, what, what kind of scientific purpose you are going to do, and what kind of contribution you expected. And, and then you can have the permission to dive into a uh, shallow ocean and also use underwater drill to penetrate the live corals. And you can see from this diver, this is what they sample. And for this um, size, of course, if the coral is big enough, they can heal by itself. But uh, we have to be very careful if you want to do this kind of studies. You need to select big piece of corals. If you target smaller ones, you just kill it directly. And the sample look like this. Uh, these arrows, uh, I should say, these rule, rulers represent 10 centimeters. So um, a piece of course looks like this, the size is r r roughly like this. And sometimes um, if you didn't operate it carefully, it breaks in the middle, but usually it won't happen underwater. Now, uh, later I will show you some slides. Um, it's Dr. Shen's results um, for Taiwanese coral studies. So for those corals, if somehow you cannot drill, oh, sorry, if somehow you cannot drill the core, you can have a selection to pick up a little piece with permission and slice it. Look at this. This is one several slides of a live corals. And usually you can see the annual bendings. So for corals, we also have two methods to determine the age. One is very direct, just to count the rings, like three rings and ice cores, if it's live corals. However, if somehow you cannot count the rings very successfully, you can use uranium to date the absolute age as well. For this one, specifically, it's very easy to count it. And anyway, um, two professors from Department of Geoscience at National Taiwan University, they went to Vietnam to collect some uh, cave deposit. And here is their photos. We call this kind of things speleosomes. And this is what they want. Usually they prefer these types because the drip water uh, drip down and gradually precipitate uh, grows this. And usually it can provide a really long term uh, records for local climate. And in the cave, basically, uh, now we are not talking about the tourist cave. It's some caves um, without human disturbance. So basically, it's really dark inside. Your only light source is your headlight. So that's why um, we say it's, it's dangerous. And in the past, when scientists initially start this kind of research, some people did uh, get traps inside and, and died there. But nowadays, scientists know more about how to survive or how to move around, how to collect samples safely in those caves. 
And in the next slide, I'm going to show you some some photos of this deposit. We call it speleosomes. And the way we do it is we uh, cut it, bring it back. Of course, when you sample this kind of stuff, you also need permission from local governments because usually these kind of caves are uh, protected by laws. So what we do is we cut it and we slice it into half. Like these. These are four speleosomes. Oh, actually, this, this should be another half blocked by this photo. And um, let's take this for example. It's easier to see. So in the beginning, it's a small dome and gradually deposits to grow like this. And sometimes, if the environmental change a little bit, for example, if the drip water stops, it will create a line of uh, of uh, hiatus, which is a darker line. And usually, it will be more dusty, so the color becomes uh, heavier here. And in this case, you can also see this speleosin, you from the darker line, you can tell it's growing, the, the, the outer surface of it's growing. You can even see in the beginning it's upright growing and gradually tilted a little bit. And why do they collect these samples in Vietnam? It's because um, in that area there are lots of volcanic activities and there was some evidence to show um, some of the hiatus corresponds to local volcanic event. So scientists wanted to re retrieve dust or some, some coarse grains from these darker layers, hoping to have some volcanic signatures recorded in the speleosome. And why is this important? It's because uh, we know uh, there were volcanic activities in the past, but usually we could not know the age of that. But for speleosomes, you can use uranium series to date the age. The uncertainty is about only like plus minus 50 years. So it means if you know these lines were caused by volcanic volcanoes, and then you can know the age exactly, then you successfully date those volcanic activities, which um, can affect climate uh, within a short time. And also for this speleosome, although it looks like it doesn't help with volcanic activities, but still uh, the chemical composition of those carbonates can tell us at least uh, the water chemistry in the cave or the air temperature within the cave.